Good morning again, and welcome back to another session, another meeting of the Remnant Rally. Have you been blessed by what we've experienced so far? Oh, I tell you, this meeting this morning has just filled my soul. I can't wait till we do another one. You know, I think that we have actually achieved one of our goals. What's our first goal? To get a blessing, to receive a blessing. And boy, have we been blessed. With Dwight uh, Hall sharing with us about the, uh, what, what did they say? The, um, the Valley of Dead Trees. Now, you had to have been here. So if you, if you weren't, at least you're here now. You won't miss that. Then this morning, we heard from Pastor Mark Harmon about the Valley of Dry Bones. And boy, there were miracles in both of those messages. They were just wonderful. So we are so glad that you have come back so that we can be blessed once again with what uh, will be shared by Pastor Corey Jackson. So we just want you to sit back. Remember, we're here to get a blessing, to be a blessing, and to share a blessing. So make sure that you're thinking about those Bibles that you have at home and those friends you have to reach so that they can participate so that the Bibles for Africa Project can be realized in a success by your participation. Thank you. This is just a small taste of what it's going to be like in heaven when we all get together. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing a song, Mansion Over the Hilltop. I just can't wait for that day when we all get to have our own mansions. Amen? Words are on the screen. I've, I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land. Next song we're singing is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer. Our next song is uh, one of my favorite songs growing up. 
I still enjoy it very much in the garden. Let's sing this together. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks approach God's throne, we always need to seek first the kingdom of God before we get caught up with the carriers of the world. And we're going to sing the song, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. I'm sure a lot of you know it. Praise the Lord for that music. Amen? Amen. And uh, I want to thank you for your participation. The Bible says in Psalm 50 that whoever offers praise glorifies me, God says. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, I'm going to now ask again that if, if you could kneel with me, let's ask the Lord's blessing on this part of our service here.
Our Heavenly Father, once again, we have come into your presence. You have called us here. You have promised a blessing. And Father, we claim it by faith in Jesus. I pray, Father, that our time spent here with you in song and in the word, in testimony, Father, I, I pray that it would draw us closer to you and make us more like Jesus. Father, this is my prayer in his name. Amen. Well, we've been talking a lot about the Bibles for Africa project, and I would like to introduce you to Deborah Race, who's the coordinator for this project. And I'd like to ask you, Deborah, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this and some of the things you do to coordinate the project. Well, I, I retired as a Bible worker up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I came down here, and Dwight Hall is my, was my Sabbath school teacher, and he said that he thought I was not retired yet. <laughs> So we came to work for Bibles for Africa. And um, I understand that you have a couple of exciting testimonies that you can share with us about how people are responding to the need. Well, Debbie, I think it's, it is, I have one of the best jobs w along with a few other of my friends in the office, uh, Desiree and Debbie and other people take calls and we get to actually listen to the people who are part of this amazing team that's been uh, compiled and it comes across all the states and also we were in you know people in Australia people in New Zealand people all over the world are trying to participate and um, when we get it when we get together we are we are helping them to have the materials that they need in the field to get the job done in a way that they'll that they'll be most successful and they, we, we send them bulletin inserts and donation envelopes and the DVDs. And most of the time, uh, if somebody has already had a DVD, sometimes they get so excited, they, won't, they don't even call us. They, they're like half down the road getting, getting the project together before we even get to them. And, and we help them to know, you know how to ship the Bibles to us and things like that. Well, now these, um, well, some of the testimonies that are going to be coming through, but you shared that all around the country and it sounds like around the world you have people that are participating in this project. I looked at our donor base the other day and I saw that we had over 5,300 some donors that I, that I don't believe we, ever, we had before we started Bibles for Africa. And these are people that are just getting excited, you know, they hear, they'll watch that DVD and they find out that somebody is going without food for three or four days to have enough money to buy a Bible. And, you know, I can't even watch that DVD without crying. I mean. So people are actually sacrificing. They're not just going home and pulling a Bible off the shelf. They may be doing that as well. Mm -hmm. But people are sacrificing so that they can participate in this project? Yes. I, in fact, one of our um, coordinators in the field, Anita Mitchell, she's from Glendora, California. And she told me about a lady that had been a rock hound. And she and her husband had collected collected rocks, they had geodes, they had all kind of really neat things. And finally, when they heard about the Bibles for Africa project, they decided that this is what they wanted to do. Uh, and they, um, they got together and they put their, their collection up for sale, and their collection sold for a little under $300. And, you know, the lady's 88 years old. <laughs> She's just, she just thrilled me she, that, that you know, something dear to her heart. Maybe she was going to give it to her grandkids or something, but it's been laid up as treasure in heaven now. And that small church, they collected Bibles, they've shipped Bibles, they've collected money, and they've, all the way from California. And, you know, some people will say, well, isn't it more economical to just send some money from California? And it is, but, you know, we might have a $30, $40 Bible on our shelf, and if you can get it to us for a, a dollar or less... We can send it to Africa for probably under 12 cents. So it's, it becomes a real blessing. And out there in that lobby, have you seen the Bibles that people have been bringing yes, to the rally? Yes, all kinds of Bible <laughs> Bibles. We're going to have other testimonies about some of the folks that have brought some Bibles. And I know some people came up from Kentucky with oodles, oodles of Bibles. <laughs> like in the numbers of 500 or something like that? Uh, or yes, just, oh, yes. Wow. Somebody else... Uh, from Ohio, 300 Bibles. She told me, I'm bringing 300 Bibles. That was Gloria Henson. She said, I'm bringing 300 Bibles in the back of my car. And I thought, good gas mileage. <laughs> oh, boy. Wouldn't we love to have her stop by a policeman to kind of check out her, to see what 
That would be really interesting, what I'm sure. What kind of contraband is That's this, right. anyway? We, you know, we are blessed to live in a country that, that we have this kind of freedom. I, I don't know whether Dwight told the story or not already on 3ABN, but one of the stories that was first I heard when I came, it was about there, there was a, there's a, uh, a wonderful prison down in Tennessee that the, the um, inmates found out about our project, and they wanted to share Bibles with people in Africa. Because, you know, Matthew 24 says, go ye therefore into all the world. And how are they going to do that, really? They've got a certain amount of limitation on their freedom. But, and I felt bad. I thought, shouldn't those Bibles all be inside the, the institution, you know? And, but praise the Lord. And if any of those, uh, oh, those guys are listening, we're so thankful because we received a lot of Bibles from them. And then they took up an offering and sent offering too. Isn't that wow, wonderful? That's tremendous. That's tremendous. And the other day, I was um, following up. We get to follow up. Desiree and I get to call people all the time. And, and we, were, we were calling. I was calling this one lady that ordered some, she ordered five Ten Commandments twice removed. And she ordered the free DVD. So I called, and it was the United Methodist Church. And she was the secretary. She said, our pastor received this book, Ten Commandments Twice Removed, and he wants five more of them. And I thought, this is wonderful. And I said, and so how did you hear about the project Bibles for Africa? And she said, um, well, I just saw it on, online there when I was ordering those. And she said, I think it might be a really interesting program. And so we're sending her an introductory packet. And I believe that the pastor is going to receive some more sample books. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Different titles, maybe. Yes. <laughs> so you've had people not only in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but a variety of other denominations and people all over that are really contributing and participating in this project. When people know that the Word of God is life-changing, I mean, it's, it's changed our life. You know, we, we read the Bible every day to stay changed. You know, we, we want to da die daily and say, and say, Lord, please change me. Well, in Africa, uh, I think Dwight brought it out that um, one Bible may be shared by up to 20 people in their homes. And at ASI convention, uh, we had a, uh, a young surgeon and his wife was a family doctor, and they were asking for French Bibles. And I said, oh, Dwight, what are we going to do? And he says, well, we're going to keep going. We're going to buy it. We're going to publish some Bibles in, in French. We're going to publish some Bibles in Swahili by God's grace, you know. And I believe that this is, the, this is really a time because those people are, are living on the edge where there are so many orphans, so many little children that are raising themselves because the parents are HIV infected. It's not to us to judge that. That's a communicable disease that, that is across the borders with, you know, every, every orientation, all kinds of things. It's not really the way we think about it, but these people need the Word of God. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking of when we travel a little bit, or I've heard the story, that sometimes people will get a hold of a part of a Bible. They may just get a chat, you know, just one book, and they hold it dear, and they read it over and over, but that's all they have. Mm. They may only have a part of the Gospel of John, but they would love to have access to the whole Bible and all what God shares in his word. You know, what's striking me about what's going on with this project is the level of sacrifice that people are making. And um, somebody will call up and say, I have this Bible that belonged to my mother, but it's sitting on the shelf. And I don't want it to just sit on the shelf. I want it to go and do something. It's large print. It's got marking in it. Is it okay? I said, it's more than okay. Send that Bible. And uh, somebody else heard about the birthday uh, money that was collected by the one young man. And she was calling me. She was from Hawaii. She was on the, driving around in Washington State or something. Anyway, she said, I heard about that birthday money, she said, and I'm going to donate $50. And then she said, before it was over, she said, you know, I have Mother's Day money too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna contribute my Mother's Day money and put me down for a hundred dollars. Well, praise the Lord! I tell you, all that money is going to a good cause. Listen, Deborah, in the time that we have remaining, can you share with us how has working with this project impacted you personally? Well, first of all, it's a job that you want to wake up early to get there, and nobody leaves late, and nobody leaves early. Everybody's. Just like we could talk about this magnet at, uh, at the Remnant Publications building because nobody is leaving like, okay, whistle blew, time to go. Uh, we're in personally involved. Um, I think it's reminded me of the level of maybe how the generation of Christians just before me used to give up stuff 
you know, I've grown up pretty in an affluent society. I mean, we went through the 80s. We've been through the 90s, and the Lord has blessed us. And, oh, I know a story. This gal told me at ASI. She said... At every, ASI is Adventist Layman Services and Industries. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And you're the former president of ASI. Right. And um, you know what she told me? She says, now when I go shopping and I see a cute, a cute dress or something, or I see a top, and it's 20, only $20, she says... But that could buy 10 Bibles for Africa. Oh. And then she says, and, and then I could get this, and that could buy, you know, five Bibles for Africa. And she said, to keep me straight, she says, I actually count it out and write the check at the end of the week and put what I would have spent on myself into the offering plate. Well, Deborah, thank you very much for those testimonies. We're really excited to hear what Bibles in Africa is doing for us as well as what we'll do for others. Amen. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, bright and fair And the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, oh, I'll be there When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there, oh, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory, when the glory of his resurrection share, and the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there, oh, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there, oh, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wonders, love and care, love and care. And when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there, oh, I'll be there. When the roll when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is caught up yonder, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be. Swing low, sweet chariot, come in for to carry me home. Carry me home, swing low, swing low, sweet chariot, come in for to carry me home. Well, I look over Jordan and what did I see? Come in for to carry me home. Well, it was a band of Coming after me, Ooh, come coming for to carry me home, sweet low, sweet cherry. Coming for to carry me home, sweet low, sweet cherry. Coming for to carry me home, coming for to carry me. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be home. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing like that in heaven. <laughs> Amen? Well, it's my pleasure. I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker. Now, I have to tell you that Corey Jackson is uh, my twin brother. And some of you are going to snicker at that. But I want to tell you that the Lord looks on the heart and not on the outward appearance. Corey and I have pastored together in the Grand Rapids area for some time. We both love God. We love His Word. We've experienced a life-changing power. And, uh, 
and uh, we love the souls for whom Jesus died. And so our hearts are knit together. I am just glad that he is here. Uh, Corey now is in the Detroit area. He's the pastor of the Detroit Northwest and the Farmington Church is there. He's also the head of the Lazarus Project. It's a project for, at, it's an at-risk program actually for inner city kids. And so praise the Lord for that. And there's so much more I could say about Corey. He, uh, he's going to share a little bit of his testimony, but I'll tell you, this man knows the life-changing power of God's Word. He used to be a, a Black Panther, and uh, he's done his testimony before under the title from Black Panther to Black Pastor. <laughs> and so he's going to share a little bit of that today and tomorrow, but uh, I know that the Lord will speak through him and that we will be blessed. And uh, Pastor Jackson, let the Lord do his thing. Amen. Good day, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the rendition of When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. The, the interesting thing for me is that the Lord is so good that Sam and Amber used to be members of my church, and the Lord even allowed me to, to, to bring Amber into the fold. And so it's a great thing to be able to have them sing before me. I can't tell you how elated I am. Well, we'll get started. Were you blessed this morning from Pastor Howard? You know, sometimes it's hard to go behind people because there's such an expectation. But this is God's time. So let's, let's kneel together as we seek him. Dear Father in heaven, I just want to humbly thank you for calling each one of us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Thank you for the precious promises that we have, and thank you that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is also our Lord. We pray, Lord, as we come now together, as we open this sacred word, that you will come by and visit with us. Lord, this is holy ground, not because of us, but because of your presence. So into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit, asking, Lord, that you would use me to reach a multitude of individuals. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I'm thankful to be part of this rally. You know, the, the word rally simply means to gather together so that you can become inspired. And we're living in such a time where it's almost hard to be inspired because there's so much bad news around us. Amen? And so I entitled this sermon today, uh-oh, I forgot to have my V8. When I was a little boy, I didn't like vegetables at all. Matter of fact, I could not stand them. And it wasn't until I became a Christian 10 years ago and decided to be a vegetarian that I had to start liking vegetables. <laughs> and, and even though there are some that I struggle with, I eat them. But there are this popular commercial that's on the, the, the TV today. And basically, whenever you see there's this commercial, it's about the V8 juice, fruit juice, and one particular one that I like is he's about to throw away his vegetables. In the midst of throwing away his vegetable, his wife hits him dead in the noggin. And, he, and she says, uh-oh, you should have had your V8. And so when I think about that, I think about the understanding behind it. And the understanding behind it is if you don't have your vegetables, that your life would be off balance, would be unhealthy. I never knew the importance of vegetables, even though my mother would scream at me about eat your vegetables, son, this, that. But now being a vegetarian, I understand I can't live without them. And it's the same way in the spiritual life that I believe that many of us are not taking our vegetables, which is the word of God. And some of us have forgotten the V8. And so if you were closer, I would probably hit you in the noggin and said, uh-oh, you should have had your V8. As we look in the world around us, it's seemingly not getting any, any better. Matter of fact, it's a jungle out here. My children, they love to go to the zoo. And I'm at the point now where I may not have to pay to go to the zoo anymore, especially in the city of Detroit, which is the second most violent city in America. I can just go to a 
local neighborhood and watch the tigers and the animals and the bears. Oh, my. But it's a sad commentary where we live and how we live. And I want to tell you that that's not far from many of us. Anytime you and I don't spend time with God, there's a beast that resides in all of us. I was looking at CNN. I'm an advocate of watching news. If there's anything I'm guilty of is watching CNN too much. And yesterday as I was watching the news, I, I, I listened to a man who was watching his girlfriend's baby. And you probably heard about it. He was giving her a bath. She didn't like her hair washed. She began crying. The crying got even more intense. He got so upset with her, he threw her in the dryer. He threw her in the dryer. The dryer had already been on, so you know that the heat was already exceedingly hot. But he threw her in the dryer, and he says for only five seconds as though he's some hero. But that's the type of world we live in, where there's bestiality all around us, from violence to, to sexual predators. There's a website out now for pedophiles that, that teaches them how to get close to a child without breaking the law. And he's a pedophile. And it's on the Internet. If you have your Bibles, I know you do, go to Isaiah 64, verse 6. And unlike Pastor Howard, I love when people say amen. And then in, in my church, if, you don't, if you're not there, they generally say, give me a minute. So we won't leave anyone out. Amen? So if you're not there yet, you can simply say, give me a minute. Isaiah chapter 64. Talking about the need of having a V8. Verse 6 simply says, but we are, we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags and we do all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us where? Away. So the best that I could give God is still like a what? Filthy rag. Go one book over to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah the 13th chapter. Familiar text. Verse 23. The Bible says it this way. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the lepers his spots, then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing what? Evil. So, so you and I are used to doing what? Evil. I'll give you an example. Say you're having a bad day. I don't know you folk, you don't have a bad day. But say you're having a bad day. And for some reason, the shoes you wore last night just all of a sudden develop a corn on one of your toes. And all of a sudden, someone comes in, happy-go-lucky, and they're smiling, not really paying attention to what they're doing, and they just step on your foot. You're tired, you're irritated, and your corns hurt. Your first response would be, hey, thank you. Have a great day. Your first response would be this, but then you catch yourself. So our first response generally is what? Of evil. And so God says that our righteousness is as filthy rags, and we're accustomed to doing what? Evil. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, says that the heart is deceitful above what? All things. And desperately what? Wicked. So it tells you already of our condition before we even get started with the message. Uh-oh, I should have had a what? V8. A favorite, one of my favorite books, the, the Mount of Blessings, page 22, says this. The heart of man is by nature cold, dark, and unloving. The heart of man by nature is cold, dark, and what? Unloving. This is the reason why it's easy for someone to kill a baby, mess with a child, rape someone, rob someone, kill someone without a moment's known because anytime you and I are not possessed by Christ, we are in our natural state. Are you with me so far? 
And I want to show you a real life example of this, if I may. Turn in your book to the to, in your Bible to Daniel chapter four. One of the one of the horrifying things about society is that no matter if you have security alarms, no matter if you have an arsenal, there's still a chance that you and I are subject to violence. Amen? No matter if we're in cold water or Detroit, you're subject to some type of violence. There was a young girl in Minnesota, age 14, who was pregnant. And her parents did not know she was pregnant. Now, how that is, I don't know. But they did not know she was pregnant. So she has the baby, and of course, because her parents did not know, she wanted to get rid of the baby. And so she decided that she's going to kill the baby and hide the baby in the garage. Now, killing the baby is sad enough, but she commenced to stabbing the baby 135 times. Now, t you tell me. What's wrong with that picture? This is the world we live in. And in each one of us, there's a beast ready to lunge out. Are you with me so far? All you have to do is have a bad day and watch the beast come out on your spouse, on your children, on your coworkers, or even somebody in the church family. You can have a bad day and walk into Myers. And she misring up your amount. And it's more than you have in your pocket. And there will be terror at the counter. There's a beast in all of us. And Nebuchadnezzar is a perfect example of this. In Daniel chapter 1, and I'll review for you for, for, purpose, for time purposes. Nebuchadnezzar had many chances to accept God. Amen. In Daniel chapter 1, we see Daniel, who was taken away from his family into captivity, and scholars believe he was age 17. And 17 years old, he is in Babylon, the greatest nation at the time. And, and because of his wisdom, Nebuchadnezzar decides that Daniel and his three Hebrews were going to be scholars for him. And so he told them that they need to change their diet that they need to eat like him, eat his food and drink his wine. And so Daniel says, not so, king. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. That even our young people, when they're taught right, will be obedient. So Daniel said, not so. He said, do you understand by doing this what you put me at risk to do to you? Daniel understood the God he served, so he says, just give me 10 days. And just give me vegetables and water and watch God work. And after 10 days, you know the story, he was 10 times what? Stronger and wiser. And so the king saw it. So the king should have known right there that it's something strange about these boys. Then you get to Daniel chapter 2. The king had the strange dream of the metal man. And he gets all of his soothsayers and his astrologers and his scientific men. And, of course, they could not tell him what the dream was. They go to Daniel. Daniel's fine. What's the commotion? And, and Daniel says, just... Give it to me. And Daniel has an all-night prayer meeting. Him and his three Hebrew worthies. And they're in there praying. And, and, and Daniel is given a vision from God. And, and Daniel goes to the king and explains to the king exactly what the dream interprets. And, and the king acknowledges God. Then you get to chapter 3. The temporary fix of conversion lasts shortly. Because now he sees this head of gold and he says, oh, that's me. He makes this 90-foot statue in the plain of Dura. He commences everybody to come and do what? Worship. At the sound of the music, they were supposed to drop down and bow down and, and dance and all this other stuff. But the three Hebrew brothers says, not so, king. And he says, if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And he says, even if you do, you'll know that the God we serve. Amen is stronger than you. But he get inside, and there's four in the mist. Don't you, don't you tell me that Jesus is never with you. 
even in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. How God going to make something cool when it's hot? Hello. Amen. The king sees it and acknowledges again. But again, it's only a temporary fix. Now, the thing that I enjoy about the Lord is that he's a chaser. Amen? He chases us. You know, I've been married to my wife for 12 years now. And we just renewed our vows last Sunday. And I chase my wife. Amen. I chased her so much, I tackled her. And I'm still holding her down. But, but God chases his people. He chases be, us because he created us and he loves us. Amen? Now, don't misunderstand. There comes a time when probation will close. Don't misunderstand that. But in Christ's Object Lessons, page 218, the, the book says, The heart that does not respond to divine graces becomes hardened until it is no longer susceptible to the influence of the Holy Spirit. The heart that does not respond gets hard. As a pastor, as a gospel of this ministry, I've seen it, that hearts have grown hard on this message of salvation. But even in the midst of that, God still continues to try to what? Soften us. And he'll take us through experiences. Are you with me so far? And here, Nebuchadnezzar had three different experiences, three different chapters that show who God was. And yet, and still, he only had a temporary conversion that only lasted a few moments. Then it takes us to Daniel chapter 4 and, and verse 10. Daniel chapter 4, the king has another dream, and I'll read it to you. The Bible says in verse 10 of Daniel chapter 4, Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. And I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was food for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the air of heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed on it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and holy one came down from heaven. He cried with a loud voice and, and said, Thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron of brass and the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with dew of the heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven years pass over him. Can you imagine having a dream like this? That you have a dream and, and you, this tree and everything under the sun receives its fulfillment from you. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere... Cut down the tree. Shake the leaves. Now me, I would have woke up in a panic. Especially if I didn't know the understanding of it. Nebuchadnezzar having a history with Daniel calls me. Daniel, I need to know the interpretation. It's important. The interpretation is given in verse 22, 25. Excuse me, 26 and 27. In verse 22, he says, It is you, king. You are grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reach unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 26. And whereas thy commandment to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after thou have known that the heavens do rule. So God says, I got to let you know that I'm a transform of hearts. But because you're being hard head right now, Nebuchadnezzar, I got to take you through the fire. You know any hard head people out there? Don't, don't look at them. You give them away. But, but he said, I got to take you through something to let you know that I'm in control. 
Because I want your heart above anything else. Are you with me so far? See, God's word transforms us from beast. I'll tell you the rest later. He, it, it's there to transform us. Otherwise, we will be like a valley of dry bones. Verse 27. Careful instruction. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off your sins, your say by righteousness, by being righteous. And thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it will be for a lengthening of thy tranquility. So he says, all right, here's what needs to happen. You need to take the counsel that I give you. And then you need to start living right. You need to start living what? Because you've listened to me. Not only do you start living right, but now you start showing mercy because now you're living a righteous life. You're showing mercy to the poor. Isn't that right? So, so he has the counsel. Now, he knows that Daniel is a man of God. And everything that Daniel has said, he has spoken it from God. God word, God's word never changes. Amen? If he says it, it's going to happen. Isn't that right? So, so he should have known, above all, that if I don't listen, there's going to be trouble in the camp. Pastor Howard can tell you, we counsel people, we show them Bible but yet and still, people still just don't want to listen. And you fear for them because God's word is there to help our lives to be rooted and grounded in him. That's why we have to send Bibles to Africa. Amen? So that they can have the same chance that we have. The king, being like most of us, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, some of our grandfathers, he, he's kin to us somehow. Verse 29 says, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. How many months? Which equals how long? One year. At the end of 12 months, he went into his palace. Verse 30 says, the king spoke and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Is this not the Babylon that I have built? I've done this. All of this is mine. All of it is mine. Not giving God credit at all, but Nebuchadnezzar had a problem. He had a pride issue. And you have to understand that God is trying to cut out everything from our life that would stop us from being translated. Are you with me so far? And it's only by his word that we know it. Uh-oh. I should have had a V8. But before we get to the next verse, let's look at the time frame. He had 12 months to repent. He had 12 months to get Bible studies. He had 12 months to get pastoral counseling. He had 12 Months to go to church every week. He had 12 months to go to prayer meeting. He had 12 months to have a, a small group Bible study. He had 12 months, y'all. He had 12 long months. God was waiting. Don't you tell me my God is not a patient God. Let me show you. Second Peter chapter 3. Hold your thumb there. Hold your thumb there. And go to Second Peter 3.9. I know most of you can recite it. But Second Peter 3.9. Second Peter Chapter 3. And when you're there, please say amen. amen. Second Peter, chapter 3. Second Peter, uh, chapter 3. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should what? Come to repentance. God is waiting for people to get their lives in order. And the only way that happens is when they know the word of God. So for 12 months, he's waiting on, on Nebi. For 12 months, he's waiting for him to change his thought pattern. For 12 months, he's waiting for him to stop listening to certain music. For 12 months, he's waiting for him to stop hanging out with certain friends. For 12 long months, he's waiting. Just like he's waiting for some of us in this very room. For 
12 months, he's waiting for some of us to stop fornicating. For 12 months, he's waiting for some of us to stop using perverted language. For 12 months, he's waiting for some of us to, become, to come out of an adulterous relationship. For 12 months, he's waiting for some of us to stop our lustful practices that we have. For 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop watching movies that lower the Christian character. For 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop listening to music that, that brings out the animal passion. For, for 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop being so mean and so hateful. For, for 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop gossiping. For, for 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop being judgmental and hypocritical. And for 12 months, he's waiting for us to be more faithful in our giving ourselves to God. For 12 months, he's waiting for us to act like we know in whom we believe. For 12 months, he's waiting for prejudice and racism and sexism and ageism and all that stuff to be removed. For 12 months, he's waiting. For 12 months, he's waiting to remove everything that stuns the Christian growth for 12 months. He's sitting back, waiting. Jesus is intercessing for us. 12 months, he's waiting for us to stop going to the casinos. And 12 months, he's waiting for us to eat and live right. For 12 months, y'all, he's waiting for you and I. 12 months. Now, I don't know about you, but if my wife, if I was, the, was like Gomer, I don't know if I had 12 months. I love my wife to death. But if she decided to walk out on our relationship and sleep with somebody else, I don't know if I'll give her 12 months. Judgment will be executed. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have 12 months. 12 months is a long time. 365 days, 52 weeks. That's a long time. All you got to do is ask someone who's engaged, and their marriage is 12 months from now. I've had some come up past. Can we speed this process up? Can we change the wedding date? Can we hurry up and, you know, get married? Time is running. 12 months, y'all, is a long time. But God is so gracious that he's waiting for Nebuchadnezzar to get his life together. And unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar, like many of us, won't listen. Verse 31. Verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed. The brother couldn't even get the words out of his mouth before the Lord executed the prophecy. Did Daniel prophesy to the bones? He did. He said, change. But he didn't want to listen. And he says, unto you, the kingdom is departed. In verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers. And his nails like bird's claw. This is the king, brothers and sisters. This is not the servant. This is not the jekyll. This is the king. Can you imagine one, one early morning, your responsibility is to go to the king and serve him his cup of tea for the day. And you go and you knock on the door. And you don't hear anything and it becomes strange to you. So you knock a little bit louder. Boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden you hear something go, Rawr! You know the king don't have any pets in the room. So instantly your heart starts shaking. You drop the T. You're nervous. You hear it again. Rawr! So you immediately call the captain guards. And everybody's running, running, coming. What's going on? Listen, wait, listen to me knock. Boom, boom. Rawr! And now they're scared because they know the king did not go and buy some pit bulls and German shepherds and bulldogs. So they pry the door open just a little bit. They peek in, and they always send the one who's the scariest in first. 
Some of y'all must have been in that boat. <laughs> so he pries the door open. He peeks in. And he's walking slowly. He don't see anything. He's like, come on. He keeps moving. Come on, scary cats. Now, the king is nowhere in the room. And all of a sudden, you hear the noise. Rah! You jump and you fly around the room and you look around. There's no nothing there. And then you go to the courtyard. The balcony where the king is. Usually have his midday sun. And you go and you look over. You come back and just as though you just seen a dead man. And here you see the king of the greatest nation on earth on all fours eating grass, man. Eating grass. Claws long and hair is long and he looks up. Ah! He's the king. I know some of you may look like that in the morning before you go get all beautified. <laughs> if you were honest, this is how I wake up. <laughs> Amen. But the, the king now is a beast. Now, scholars believe that he wasn't really a beast. They simply suggest that he had lost his mind for seven years. And when you lose your mind, your nails grow long, your hair is unkempt, and you act like a beast. But my Bible said he was like a beast eating grass. There are beasts in this room right now. There are beasts watching all around the world. When church folk don't live according to God's word, you become a beast. All you got to do is catch someone at the wrong time. And you're like, where did that come from? Can we pray together? No, we ain't praying together. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, uh-oh, I forgot to have my V8. When you don't get your V8, you begin to feed the beast. Are you with me so far? And God has a special way of showing his people their sins. Amen? Amen. Nothing is hid from under the sun. I got a good friend. I won't say who it is or where it's from, but he has a sibling who grew up knowing God's word, who grew up knowing what God expects. And this particular individual decided to have an illustrious affair with a married individual for years. And my friend of mine found out that his sibling has HIV. And you got to understand something. The sibling wasn't in the church, didn't take the church serious, would show up you know, make a guest appearance, you know, superstar appearance, and wave and say hello and goodbye. But this particular person was in this affair for years. And now, this particular person has HIV. Can you imagine how the parent feels? Sent the, the person through church school and college and to have the, the, the kid end up like this. There's a beast and all of us lurking out. There's a place that I go to often. It's called Avon Home in Calhoun, Tennessee. And I go there three times a year because my background is a probation officer, a juvenile probation officer. So I'm used to dealing with hardcore kids. That don't mean you get to send all your kids to me either. <laughs> but this place is designed to help delinquent kids, especially those who are of the church. And when I sit and talk with them and interview them and counsel them, You'd be amazed how they're hooked on pornography. You'd be amazed how they're hooked on drugs. You'd be amazed on how they're hooked on all these, these negative attributes. And guess where they see it from? Their parents. There was a beast in me. Pastor Howard informed you. I was studying to be a black panther. I was studying to be a black Muslim. So 
if I was who I was back then and Brother Dwight Hall invited me to a rally, I wouldn't think it was this type of rally. Amen. But there was a beast in me, and my number one priority in life was to kill the white man. I live for that. Even though my mother sent me to college, but I'm from the south side of Chicago, which is a very segregated area where Farrakhan is the man, his temple and everything is there, the, the mosque. And so I grew up in the early 90s of my teenage years, and that's when all the black pride started resurging in the Black Panther Party. And so as I got to Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, there weren't too many folk looked like me on my, at the campus. And so my run-ins with folk were always. And so my buddies and I, we just knew that we were going to kill us a white man one day. That was our desire. It really was to kill us a white man. We was waiting for the opportunity. All he had to do was say that wrong word, and it was on. And I developed this hardness of the heart, and as a result of that hardness, my, my temper became very quick, so that if we got into it, I would swing before I asked questions. See, that's how I was taught. Oh, don't worry. No, I'm not like that now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, it's only one of me. <laughs> And I won't give you too much because I'm going to tell you more tomorrow. But, but the whole point is, if I could have been around fours like a beast, it would have been me. But when God gave me this message through a mentor of mine named Rich Magsby, it began to soften my heart. So my desire to kill began to diminish. My desire to hurt began to diminish. And all the desires that I had, that I had grown up with in the world began to diminish, and as a result, God touched my soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And God has a funny way of showing you how he's broken you down. So when I came into the church, the first person I, I brought to the church was a white female. <laughs> Isn't that something? Does God have a sense of humor? Amen? But I was a beast. And I don't mind acknowledging I was a beast, but even when I got in the church... I still was a beast because I was eating the wrong type of food spiritually. Are you with me so far? See, you can be in the church and not be part of the church and not be looking towards heaven, but I was still a beast. I was not drinking my V8. Are you with me so far? I was drinking some other type of stuff. So I would go to church, and then after church, I would still go to my blockbuster videos. I, I would still hang out with some of my friends. I would still do this, that, and the third. I was not drinking the V8. I did not have my mind on spiritual things. But I was in the church. But I was still a beast. Are you with me so far? So Nebuchadnezzar now is a beast. Now, if the story ended there, there's no hope. Amen? Amen? Amen. He's a beast, y'all. He's the king. Look at the picture. He's a beast eating grass, man. Oh, but my God is gracious. He is gracious. Go to Daniel chapter 4. Look at verse 15. I get excited. So if I get to jumping around the camera, can't catch me, I'm sorry. But, but, but God, ha he shows us something in his word that even though we can act like a beast, there's still hope. Amen? Amen. Daniel chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots. In the what? In the earth. Even with the band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. God says that even though I'm going to cut down the tree, save the root. See, you don't understand, sir. He said, I'm going to cut down the tree, but I'm going to save the root. I'm going to keep it in the earth. 
Some ought to get excited. I'm going to cut down the limbs of, of pride, the limb of, of sexual perversion, the limb of adultery, the limb of hatred, the limb of anger, the limb of, 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 of lustful desire, the limb of lying, the limb of cheating. But I'm going to leave the root. And not only am I going to leave the root, but I'm going to put a metal band around it. See, the metal band is there to protect it from cracking and splitting in two. Because if it's splitting in two, it's dead. Are you with me so far? So, so God says, I'm going to cut the, all the sinful stuff down, but I'm going to leave the root. And I'm going to leave it in the earth because in the earth is where the nutrients are. And then I'm, gonna, I'm going to take care of what the do from heaven. Are you with me so far? See, see, God does not want to destroy us. He wants to save us, but he'll cut you down. But he'll leave the root and he'll put a band around it so that you won't crack, you won't split because he don't want you to die. Are you with me so far? Nebuchadnezzar did all that. God cut him down to a beast, but yet he kept the root. And then not only did he keep the root, he then put a band around it to protect it. He said, that's my tree. That's my stone. And because of that, I can't take damaged goods to heaven. Amen? That's good stuff, isn't it? And even though Nebuchadnezzar was a knucklehead, God saw fit that he needed to save him. God wants to cut away the sin from our lives. He cut out my anger, my pride, my lack of faithfulness, my lack of willingness. He cut all that down while I was threatened with 15 years of prison. He says, I got to get that boy right there. I, was, I used to tell folk, Jesus is a white man for the white folk. Where the black Jesus at? Uh, you know, I'm radical. I start telling folk that the Bible was written by Shakespeare. I used to think that all pastors and preachers were pimps. Look at me now. I told you God got a sense of humor. I just knew that what was in this word wasn't true. And he says, let me cut this boy down. But I'm going to save, save the root. Because there's something I see in him that he don't see in himself. So I'm going to chop him down. All the way to the ground. But then I'm going to feed him. I'm going to read to him. I'm going to send him away to a small school in South Dakota called Mission College. I'm going to convert him. I'm going to teach him how to love everybody and not just one body. God wanted to cut all this down so that the man can sprout again. Go to Job chapter 14. Job is the book before Psalms. Job, come go with me. Job, Job. Are you with me so far? Uh-oh. We should have had a what? Job 14. Job 14. Job 14, verse 4. Are you there? Amen. The Bible says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as in hurling his day. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. For there is hope. For there is hope of a what? Of a tree if it be cut down. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. That it, it, it'll what? It'll sprout again. He's, God, so what that the tree get cut out? God says, I need to sprout it again so it can be my tree. See, you and I have grown our own trees. We've grown the tree the way we wanted to. And because of that, our life is not going the way we want it to go. So if you can put a stamp on it, it, it'll be Pastor Jackson's tree. But it needs to be God's tree. So he says, I'll cut it down. For the whole purpose that it'll do what? It'll sprout again. And when it sprouts again this time, guess who's in control? Jesus isn't in control. Because then he can hang on the top of it. My tree. Only for me. Go back to Daniel chapter 4. Go back to Daniel chapter 4. We coming to a close. Daniel chapter 4. This is why folk in Africa need Bibles. 
so they can get what you got. They can see themselves perhaps as beasts to come again to get their insane, their saneness back. Are you with me so far? Daniel chapter 4. For seven years, this brother was a beast. And unfortunately, some of us would have to go through trials and tribulation for seven long years <clears throat> until God gets our attention. Now, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But if it happens, then he's in control. Amen? Amen. My wife and I, we have three kids. Our oldest daughter is a senior in high school. Our youngest boy is in eighth grade. Our, second, our oldest boy is in eighth grade. And our rambunctious one is in second grade. My wife and I, we have family devotion. We have prayer. And we explain to them, if you don't have an experience with Jesus, a what? Experience, experience with Jesus, your reading would be meaningless. And you will leave this house and become a beast. And if God has to take you down the road and back, we know he will. Some of us have to go through the fiery trials to be beast. And for some of us, it takes years. You know, I've been in my church, Detroit Northwest now for a year. And I'm watching so many of the kids who've left the church as teenagers begin to come back. And then when I listened to the horror stories of how they lived, I said, it's only by God's grace that you're still alive. Do you know the stories that our children go through when they leave God's church? And they come back and the horror stories that's there? So young people, don't leave. Because you will become a beast. But you can be a beast in the pew too. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 34. He says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High God. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from one generation to, from, from generation to generation, excuse me, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou at the same time lord have mercy my reason my mind return unto me and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness return unto me and my counselors and my lords sought unto me and i was established in my kingdom, an excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, the hard-headed dude, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those that walk in pride, he's able to what? To it took him seven years to realize that. It took him seven years to finally acknowledge that God was who he said he was. Seven years. Seven long years. But he had to come back to the word of God in order to find who God is. There's a beast in all of us if we don't have our V8. This is the V8 that you need to eat and drink every day. Ezekiel said, I ate it, and it was good to my belly. What about you? I want to tell you a story of, of a mountain climber, three mount, four, four mountain climbers. There were four friends one day decided they're going to climb this high and huge mountain. In the midst of climbing this mountain, it was competitive. And so they're climbing the mountain, rock climbing, and then it started to get dark outside. And as it got dark outside, on this particular night, the cloud, it was very cloudy, the stars did not show the light, the moon was not visible, it was very, very, very dark. And so as they began to go up higher, Three of the friends says, hey, we need to stop and camp here for tonight. 
But see, there's always one in the bunch who's going to do what they want to do anyway. He decided, you know what? I'm getting to the top. You guys are some girls. So they decided, the three friends decided to camp for the night. And they figured, we'll just finish in the morning. It's not that serious. But, but no, 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 not this one. This one decided he's going to keep going because he has a point to prove. And he's climbing away. And it's dark. It's so dark he can't even see his hand before his face. But he said, oh, I got to get to this top. I got to get there. Ah, these guys are some losers. So he's climbing away. He's getting arrogant. He's so prideful. And he's climbing away. And all of a sudden, he launches out to, to put his javelin in it, whatever it's called. And he loses. And it, all of a sudden, he begins to fall. And he's falling. He's screaming in the midst of fall. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Help me. Save me. Lord, help me. Help me. Save me. Save me. Lord, help me. Please don't let me die. And he's screaming. And I don't help, help, help. And all of a sudden, he remembers his safety harness is latched. And he's swinging in the air. And out of nowhere, hears a voice. And the voice says, cut the rope. So, the, so he thinks he's delirious because he knows he's fa- falling so far down. He hears this voice, cut the rope. He's like, no, nah, if I cut this rope, he's getting, trying to feel, it's, it's nothing there. He hears the voice again, cut the rope. He says, listen, I must be delusional. There's no way I'm going to cut this rope. No way at all. The next morning, his friends get up. They're looking for their friend. He's nowhere to be found. So they run to the local park ranger, and they tell him the story. He sends out an alert. They begin looking for the friend. And they're desperately looking for him because you got to understand it's, it's real cold this night. And they're looking for him, looking for him. They can't find him. And then all of a sudden, the park ranger calls them and says, Guys, I've, I found your friend. It's not looking too good. So his friends all came. They huddled around him. And they just stared as he lay there stillness. The thing that struck the park ranger is not that he died. It's the fact that if he would have cut the rope, he was only two feet from the ground. Two feet from the ground could have saved his life. But because he didn't want to listen to God's voice, because he didn't want to listen to God's word, he didn't know to cut the rope. Isaiah 30 says that he speaks to us and tells us this is the way, go ye in it. If you don't listen to his voice and cut whatever rope is in your life, you will be a beast soon. That's why we have the word. That's there to transform our lives and and transform our hearts. Amen? Because the Word tells me to cut down the rope. The Word tells me to cut it out my life so that I won't become a beast. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. I was faced with 15 years of prison. No way in in, in Kentucky's bluegrass that I want to see anything like that. But some of you have not cut the rope in here. And God is holding back the beast from coming out. But you're constantly feeding the beast. And God has died to kill the beast. John 15 says, if you abide in me and I in you, what's the rest? You bear fruit. But if you don't abide in me, you can't do anything. We have to learn to cut the rope. I didn't cut the rope until God sent me away to Mission College. And I didn't realize how racist I was, how prejudiced I was, even in the church, until God set me down on my bed. And I looked as though it was a panorama view of a TV, and he began to show me my life. He showed me how I was treating my wife. He showed me how I was treating my children. He showed me how I was treating his folk. And I was like, no, I must be dreaming. And I'm sitting on my bed waiting for class to start, and I'm looking at it. And everything I've ever done was on this screen like you see me on that screen now. And he says, you got to change before you leave this place. That very day, 
I got down on my knees and I asked God to forgive me. He said, don't start with me. Start with your wife. Start with your children. Start with those you hurt. Didn't come to me. And I did exactly that. And when I left that valley with mountain lions in, in, in the valley, the city boy, a whole different person from when I went. And I, I, I was terrible before I left. But you couldn't tell me nothing. But I had to cut some. And it's me. There are three things that we deal with. Self, Satan, and sin. Self, Satan, and sin. And God needs you and I to cut all of them out today. He didn't give us Nebuchadnezzar just, oh, that's a nice story to read to your children. And VeggieTales didn't make it just so you can laugh about it in the chocolate factory. God made it to show you a point. And the point is where you and I would be without him. If we don't take his word seriously. There's a lot of beasts running out here. And you and I may be one of them. And so as we prepare to pray, you need to tell God in your heart how you've been a bear, how you've been a lion, how you've been a cheetah, how you've been a raccoon, how you've been a wolf, how you've been a moose, how you've been an elephant, how you've been a rat, how you've been a cockroach, how you've been one of the worst animals ever. And he's there for you, the same as he was for Nebuchadnezzar. It's time to be honest with God. And once we become honest with God, God then can work in our life. Nebuchadnezzar was honest. But brothers and sisters, look what he had to go through in order to get there. Is that something you want? I know I don't. And I don't want it for you. So as I, as I kneel, I'm hoping you'll kneel. And I'm hoping you will surrender yourself to God right now because you don't know what you, you, what you may turn out to be. You may be like my friend's sibling who has HIV. Or you may be some female who has babies by two different daddies and none of them in your life. You may lose your job. Who knows? But the beast will come out. You may go postal one day. Uh-oh. I should have had my V8. Will you kneel with me? Our Father in heaven, what a joy it is to know that your word is true. But Lord, I pray today for all of us that there's a beast lurking in us. And the beast comes out when we have not had our V8, our word of God, to transform us, to hold us, to keep us. And I pray today that you will kill the beast in our lives, that your blood would drown it completely so that his ugly head never again arises again. There's someone here who's struggling. Lord, you direct them to where they need to go so that it can be well said at the end that it's well with their soul. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com or you can call us at 616-676-3705. You can also write to Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan. 49301. Our email address is hope 
at hopevideo.com. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. We thank you for coming. You are dismissed and allow the Lord to continue to bless you this weekend.